Hello, everybody. Good morning. Can, can, can you hear me all right? It's, uh, it's, it's really hard to be heard in, in these uh, open sessions. So uh, do, be, uh, do be patient with us. And, and, and if you can't hear, um, I, can, I can actually speak louder. I can shout. Can you hear all right? No, you can't. I don't, we might even be able to put the volume up. Is that right? No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk loud. How's that? OK. Um, well, welcome to this session. My name is Charles Gould. I'm CEO of Brightwave. And uh, this is a double session, actually. Uh, and it's a panel session. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce our three speakers. But basically, what we're going to do is we'll have um, presentations from each of them. And uh, in between, I'll ask a couple of questions. And there's an opportunity for you, if you would like to also uh, put your hand up and ask a question of each of the speakers. And then if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll review what's been said and there'll be an opportunity for, for further, further questions. So our subject for this session is uh, entitled, quite grandly, Cultures of Contribution, How to Motivate Engagement with Online Learning Communities. Now, I think we all recognize that we've always learned socially, we've always learned by asking questions and sharing ideas, usually with the nearest person sitting next to us. But of course, now that we're all using social media technology, and importantly now, um, corporate IT departments are allowing people to use social media at work, we have a huge opportunity to tap into the potential of, of social media for work. But how can what happens instinctively, organically, and compellingly outside work using social media, Facebook and, and, and Instagram and the like, how can that be harnessed in order for us to work, learn at work? And that's the question that we're going to be exploring over the next hour. Um, and we're going to focus on three key themes. So yes, we'll be talking about the technology. I mean, I think it's fair to say that many of us will be using three or four different social media platforms on a daily basis. So which one do we select to use to help us learn at work? We're also looking at the, uh, the user experience and uh, looking at what we do know about how people use social media in their everyday lives and how that can be harnessed uh, and taken advantage of for learning at work. And then, perhaps most importantly, we'll look at the culture of how people form communities, learning communities online at work, and who needs to do what to grow those communities and to ensure that your social media venture doesn't end up being a sterile, static site. So let me introduce our three speakers. Uh, first up, we have... Uh, Carl Hodler from Learner Lab, and Carl is an expert in, in user experience and user interface design. He's got, uh, he's got a background in, in both corporate learning but also in the, in the world of games. Second, our very own Jonathan Arch Archibald, who is uh, head of technical development at Brightwave, and he's been uh, responsible for the team behind our Tesselo product, our own social learning uh, product. And then finally, we have Drew Clare who's Head of Learning Technology for EMEA uh, at KPMG, and he's going to be talking about the decisions and the, and the uh, considerations that, that they uh, made in adopting their own social media platform and, and some of the experiences that they had. Good. Well, without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Carl. Thank you, Charles. We, we on, can we hear this one? Or is this one quieter? Is, just, is that okay? Good. Okay, um, so um, I'm from Learner Lab, and we're, uh, we're an independent consultancy uh, developing engagement strategies to help learning organisations and further education organisations as well better connect with audiences. Um, so uh, I'm a content strategist um, specialising in user experience and game design, and um, I've been lucky enough to spend the last seven years um, working with companies um, like BBC, Sony PlayStation and Channel 4 designing content strategies for their consumer audiences. And I, I think the impact that the consumer um, digital space is having on our learning audiences is becoming harder to ignore. 
and we set up Learner Lab to help bridge um, this gap. So today, um, I want to spend about 10, 10 minutes sort of looking to how we've got to a point where there's over 100 million how-to videos created by consumers on YouTube and what we can learn from um, an organisation like Netflix to help us build more user-focused learning content. I think last year there was, um, there was a Gartner report that some of you may have seen. One of the headlines from that was half of large organisations will have an internal Facebook-like social network by 2015, but only 30% of those will be considered essential. The other headline from that was that 80% of social business efforts will not achieve their intended benefits through 2015. And to us, this felt a bit out of alignment with the success that social networking is having in our personal lives. And I think we'd all probably agree that social networking and the use of social media has felt pretty mainstream for a few years now. In fact, if we go back to 2011, pretty much every major TV show had a hashtag um, inviting their audience to go and join in the conversation on Twitter. But what's really interesting is the fact that social networking usage is growing still, and it's growing really, really fast. And it's driving the amount of adults in the UK who are using the internet every day. 73% um, of us use the internet every day now. And the reason behind this is that 50% of us, half of us, are using social networks. And social networks, and Facebook in particular, um, are really good at getting people to return very regularly. And not just that, but they're very efficient at turning people into active users. People who don't only share content, but they contribute to the conversations as well. And the reason that we've seen this growth in activity is that 72% of us now own smartphones. Um, and last year, the sort of amount of social activity we do on our smartphones tripled. The reason that this is happening is because, as you probably know yourself, that we're looking for really short, snappy, engaging experiences to do on our mobile phones. And we know from the sort of games that we play that these really short, engaging experiences are the sort of things that are perfect for how we use our mobiles. And it turns out that social media delivers this sort of experience perfectly. And brands have realised that social media um, is really important for marketing, and they've realised this for some time. And, oh, sorry. And thanks to their investment um, in delivering product and service information, audiences are now very proficient at using social networks to learn about a brand's products and services, to discover knowledge and to share that knowledge as well. But we're not only just discovering and sharing knowledge on social networks, but we're creating it as well. And there's a phenomenal amount of how-to content that's been uploaded to YouTube just by everyday people. And people are using the creation of content to create their online identities. Um, and you know, user-generated, crowdsourced learning on YouTube is attracting absolutely massive audiences. So with the general popularity and the increasing engagement of um, social networks and the amount of content that people are actually uploading themselves to these sites, why will so many social business efforts fail? And I think we know that um, the success of social media has obviously created a demand in business for creating um, consumer, uh, sorry, consumer orientated learning uh, environments, but it also creates an expectation. So the problem that could cause 80% of people to um, not interact or engage with social business tools as we'd, as we'd want is possibly because our audiences are naturally benchmarking corporate tools against the experiences they're having in their personal lives. So they're using Facebook, um, YouTube, and they love the simplicity, the usability, and the cross-platform compatibility of these tools. And they're getting a bit turned off when they're not getting this platinum service on business systems. 
and they're not really interested in the fact that a lot of these consumer tools have had um, you know, nearly a decade of investment and refinement, um, but you can't really blame them for that. So, is it big budgets that are secret to success? Well, they can certainly help. And to spend 18 months developing and refining the latest update from Netflix, um, that wouldn't have been a cheap exercise. But they only did that because they knew there was evidence that they would have a return on that investment. And that was proven last week when they actually um, added 4 million new users in their last quarter. And these are people who tried the demo um, and they've gone on to actually being a regular paying customer. But I think we also recognise that big budgets aren't the magic bullet to... to creating um, a successful, engaging site. Because we often see big IT uh, projects going wrong. And when it comes to engagement issues, they often arise because the projects are designed around technical processes rather than the user needs. Um, I think we'd all recognize a situation where we're a bit unclear where to begin, or there's too much copy to read, or not enough detail when you actually need to get into it, or really strict username and password criteria stop us reusing the service. Um, and healthcare.gov was plagued by these problems, but you do wonder whether they could have been designed out before launch if they had more of an approach like Netflix took. So, what exactly did Netflix do that healthcare.gov didn't? And how do the consumer networks sustain growth and engagement? Um, and how can we use similar, similar engagement strategies to ensure that our social business efforts won't fail in 2015. So I'm just very quickly going to run through six strategies that we use to help motivate engagement um, with, um, with online commun uh, learning communities and uh, learning content in general. So it's very easy to experience a disconnect with an audience. Um, it's very easy to make assumptions about what your audience are looking for um, and building those into the system. Um, and I think healthcare.gov demonstrated what can go wrong um, when you make those assumptions. Whereas Netflix proved what can go right when you get a deep understanding in your audience through surveys, focus groups, uh, listening to conversations that your audience are having online. So, in order to create successful social networks for learning, it's important that we get a deeper understanding of our audiences. And we need to discover things like why and how people like to learn for work, what are their motivations and preferences, what are the sort of challenges they face, um, what they think is important, and also what conversations they're already having in the workplace, and looking at how they can be moved into a digital space. And also understanding what channels and what devices and what social media your audience is using, um, both in their personal lives and in, in their um, working life as well. And using that to create not only a business case, um, but a strategy for launching the platform. Sorry, my slides for some reason are on automatic timer, so I'm kind of racing against it here. Um, so, Communicating a clear sense of purpose. Once you know what your purpose is, it's really important to give a, a sort of shared understanding of that to your community. Um, so they understand what's in it for them, what's in it for their colleagues, and what's in it for the organization as a whole. And I just pulled out this example of Facebook, just giving an idea of how they communicate their purpose to their audience. Um, you know, you can see they, they beautifully communicate their mission statement in the update status. What, what's on your mind perfectly encapsulates what Facebook want their audience to do. Um, we should be putting our purpose at the forefront of our content and commu communication strategies so our audience are in no doubt what the core purpose of their activity on the, um, on, on, on the site should be. So it also means I can't press the button to fast forward. There we go. So the other thing that is key is to not make your audience think too much when they're on the platform. So they know what their purpose is, but they need to be able to achieve that purpose with the minimum amount of effort. Um, and you can see a lot of social networks use familiar con conventions to stop their audiences from thinking too hard. 
and you need to innovate around these conventions. And with Tesla, we had a couple of unique features that we spent most of our time really getting right. Um, and we wanted to make our audience feel confident using all the stuff that they recognize from other social media platforms. Um, so they didn't really feel any friction when it came to using the, um, the unique features um, that didn't, they perhaps didn't recognize from other sites. Looking for um, engagement trends on other networks is, um, is, is, is a really cost-effective and good way of helping drive engagement on your own community. Um, they can be a bit tricky to spot earlier on, um, but last year, for example, um, we saw Facebook and Twitter both start using kind of big hero images in people's timelines to drive um, engagement. And I think when you see two big organizations like that take on a very similar strategy in a short period of time, you can be pretty sure there's a lot of data gone into making that decision. Um, and it's something that probably will um, help drive engagement on your own, on your own um, community. I've always really liked this comment about testing, because um, it, it is very true. But really, testing should be done all the time, and it should be done with real users. Um, Netflix probably used a lot of A-B testing to see if larger images were engaging their audience. Um, but they also deployed test content to real users in their living rooms to see how people are behaving in their natural environments. You just cannot be putting your content in front of the real people who are going to be using it and seeing how they behave. Netflix, always, so Netflix also analyzed data, not only to see how their interface was working, but also to see what sort of content was being more popular. So they could streamline the amount of content they're delivering to their audiences and promote the stuff they know is being popular with segments to try and move that engagement around a larger section of their of their audience. Um, testing and evaluation will show where you're succeeding um, and it will just generally help improve the audience experience. Twitter don't actually expect any of us to go onto the site every day and use it um, and neither should we um, with our social um, experiences at work. Twitter use communications like um, system notifications, email notifications, and um, really quite engaging email messages that have strong calls to action to come back onto the network and start joining in in conversations. They, they tell you stuff like what's trending, what's happening in your network, what other people are saying, and advising other people who you should be following. And we really need to make sure that we're using all our communication platforms to effectively keep our audiences returning and using our services frequently, but also making sure they're engaged and active on those services too. And lastly, um, getting inspiration from emerging trends. Um, new technology can inspire new ways of thinking. I, I came across this app called um, MindMeld um, a few weeks ago. What it does is it listens to your conversation, and as you're talking, it gives you um, cues for interesting things that you can talk about based on your social media history and news items that you've um, looked at. And it kind of made me think, well, you know, how could something like this help kind of forward thinking on a platform like Tesla? And um, I, I thought if, we're, if I was watching a video on Tesla, the tin can API could be feeding me um, reminders of content that I viewed previously, and perhaps um, giving me snippets of copy that I can share with my colleagues and bring other people um, into this piece of content, and just sort of spreading the engagement, and sort of help spread the engagement around the community. So it's always, it's always worth looking at um, emerging trends because they do kind of help you think sideways about different things that you can bring into your own system to drive more engagement. So I, I think it's, it's impossible for us to stop um, our audiences comparing the learning experiences they have with work 
with those that they have as consumers. But we, we can definitely use techniques that these services employ to better connect with our audiences. Um, I've only really sort of skimmed through the sort of skin the surface of how we help organisations like Brightwave engage their um, engage their audiences. But hopefully, it's given you a taste of how using consumer influenced engagement strategies can help make sure that you know you're in the 20% of organisations who are getting the best results from social media by 2015. And um, just some, 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 some books that I, I, I've enjoyed over the last um, sort of 12 months. Um, I particularly like Micro Interactions, the one on the end, which um, just goes into really geeky detail about things you probably wouldn't necessarily notice when you're using the internet, but actually just make you feel so much better about the technology that you're using. Um, and a, a quick advert for our um, Twitter feed, please follow us, we post loads of stuff all about um, engaging people and trends that happen in the consumer space and looking at how we can be influenced by those in the learning space. And um, if you don't get a chance to catch up with me um, after, the, um, after the panel, um, I'll be kind of hovering for a little while um, around the Brightwave stand here. But please, if we can, if we can help you out um, engaging audiences, do drop me a line. And um, thank you very much. Oh, also, I've got, if, if I didn't get any stickers at the beginning, come and see me and get your free, free pack of stickers at the end. That's probably the most important uh, pitch. <laughs> Carl, you nearly robbed yourself of a round of applause there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Carl. Um, just stay there, if you wouldn't mind, just for, for a question or two. Um, I've got one. Um, we talked about um, the amount of content that, that users generate on these, uh, on these social media sites, huge amounts. Um, and I wondered if there's anything we can learn for uh, the way we generate and use content at work from how uh, consumer sites use curation techniques. Okay, um, well, I think you, you saw from the slide earlier that um, Facebook in particular kind of measures, or one of the measurements they have for their ongoing success is the amount of uh, active users they have on the network. So how many people are using it and putting stuff up on the site. But I think any of you who have attempted to try and find something that you posted a few weeks ago on Facebook will discover that it's just painfully difficult to actually find stuff. And these social networks that you know, we've been looking at, they're very much designed around the moment. So it's just there for that day or that even hour that you're engaging with it. And then the content is archived, but in a way that you can't really access it. And that's very different to how we need to use social networks um, in the workplace, because it's, it's important that we can find those previous conversations, we can find those links back to that amazing piece of content that you just about remember. Um, so it becomes a resource, an ongoing resource that people can continually use and refer back to. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting example of how, although we can learn a lot from consumer social media, um, maybe they don't, they're not perfect in every respect for no, uh, the way we learn at work. You yeah. certainly just can't copy it. No. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience for Carl? I can hand the microphone over if anyone does. We have one. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you could experience in, in um, basically integrating your social networks in business with all the other that we have. Um, so we've got the LMS, we've got mobile, we've got other databases, we've got email, we've got all those kinds of things. How do we make the social side of it come to life and not feel like just another place to go? I, I think it goes back to what the purpose of the social experience is. Um, and um, I, I think it, it, it's quite difficult for people to engage on a social network if they haven't really got a clear objective of what they're supposed to be um, getting out of it and putting into it as well. So um, I think, yes, it can be interesting to integrate with all your other services, but it really depends what your objectives are, what you're trying to achieve through your social network, as to whether that's something that is going to give you a, give you a benefit or possibly just um, muddy the waters for your audience and make it a bit more difficult for them to understand what they're, what they're supposed to be doing. I think your question is quite a nice segue into the next uh, 
session, in fact. And I'm going to move on now, just in the interest of, of, of time. We, we hopefully we'll have some some time for more questions. Right. We're just going to get uh, the, the microphone swapped over, and uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, Jonathan Archibald, who's going to now start looking at how. Uh, those, those things that Carl's talking about can be applied and has been applied uh, for, for the purposes of work using, using our... Um, over, over to you, John. Hello, can you all hear me? Great. Um, I haven't got any stickers, so... Um, right, so as Carl's been explaining how, uh, how important UX is and the consistency in your social system to drive engagement, I'm going to be looking at the, the technical side of things and how innovation in technology can add things into the mix and help drive the social system. Um, uh, one thing that Carl mentioned towards the end of his talk um, was that he's always looking outside into the consumer space for technical innovation, the things that are happening. He mentioned the mind mail application, which is really interesting. But actually, in the last couple of years, learning technology um, has been innovating rapidly. And um, one of the most exciting things that we've uh, discovered, and you've probably all heard of it, is um, the Tin Can API. Now, you've probably all heard the hype about the Tin Can API. It was released about a year ago. It promised big, big things. Um, it's going to change the world of e-learning. We're going to get loads of big data back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it's really easy to get overwhelmed by the big picture stuff like that. Um, so I think it's worth pointing out that the Tin Can API is at, actually at its heart a very, very simple tool. And it allows us basically to capture learning experiences from any device, any time. Um, we've got a, an example here on the screen of a, a Tin Can API statement, if you can all read it. Um, we've got Meg Green. She uh, has experienced uh, a TED Talk video on the eight secrets of success. And that's basically what the Tin Can does. It allows us to capture that information. Um, at Brightwave, um, we've been messing around with social uh, learning systems for a number of years now, but we've always felt a little bit uncomfortable about it. We haven't um, had the, uh, the, the spark that we thought was going to work within a business, and I think Carl's stats show, show that, that there's, there's some problems in social media at work, so that 80% that of the systems aren't achieving their benefits. Um, so we were, we were always a bit nervous. We've got a, uh, an LMS. We could have easily whacked on a, a forum onto the side of it and called it a social learning platform, but LMSs tend to be things that people don't want to go to. Um, so sticking a social system on the side of it isn't really going to add much. Um, so when the tin can came out, um, this really sparked our thinking. And um, it allowed us to finally come up with a model that we thought would work. Um, allowing the capturing of informal learning, informal learning experiences to help drive the social system. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through uh, the Tin Can API and how it fits into Tesla and how we've built a social system around this one simple concept of capturing informal learning experiences. So in Tesla, we've got uh, a number of ways of capturing these learning experiences. We've got uh, an iOS app, an Android app, there's a browser bookmark. And they're all designed to do one thing, and it's capture these learning experiences as easily as possible as the learner's having them. Rather than um, someone just watching a video on something and then forgetting about it and no one benefiting from that, We've built tools to enable learners to easily capture that information. So, for example, with the, with the mobile apps, you could be on the train reading a book about something really important to your work. You could get to the end of the book and finish it. Um, the apps allow you to just scan the book, scan the barcode on the book. It picks up all the information. It then saves the information back to Tesla through the Tin Can API. Um, it could be that you're attending a seminar like this. There could be a QR code. But I don't know if there are at this event, but you can scan the QR code. Again, it registers that you've been on that event. Um, the bookmark that is slightly different, that's um, where you could be at home, um, surfing the internet at night, you could stumble across something really interesting that's helped you out. So if we take our TED Talk video that we were just talking about in the previous uh, slide, um, I could have just watched that, 
Um, and all I need to do to save that back to test load is just push the save experience button at the top. Now, it's important to note that you don't have to be anywhere near test load to do this. You don't have to be logged in, you just need to push the button. It's a far and forget thing. But at this point, we've just captured learning experiences. Great. So how does that then move on to drive any social system? Um, so when you capture a learning experience in Tesla, they're your learning experiences at that point. Um, you can keep a lot of them. Um, but what helps drive the social system is the ability to then share those learning experiences with the rest of the community. Um, so in Tesla, there's a, we've got at the top there, a big share button. Uh, you click that and then your learning experiences go from being your own to being able in the community. And then once it's in the community, other learners on this platform can then start benefiting from it. They can use the same resource. They can go off and watch the video that we've been talking about. If they like it, they can comment on it. Um, they can vote on it. And as Carl was saying, um, you get the, the natural ecosystem in the social system is that people then like things, they vote things, they're popular, but they're, they're popular only for a moment of time. And the tricky thing is, is how do you then pick up that uh, video that everyone's talking about at that particular moment and then make it available to everybody so if they come on in a week, if they come on in a month, they're still going to access that without having to sit through the social feed of things. And that's where the role of the curator comes in. So in Tesla, the role of the curator is the, the subject matter expert, the person working for the business to ensure that the platform has got the best resources on it. And the curator will, is responsible for looking through the social feeds, looking at what's popular, what people are liking, and differentiating between, say, someone who's liked uh, a cat video and shared a video of a cat doing something funny, to uh, a TED talk, something like that. The TED talk is really useful to the rest of the organisation, and we don't want it to get lost. So the curator simply clicks on the curate button, they can then turn that learning experience into a resource underneath uh, a subject matter tile. So we've got, we'll put it in Motivate and Inspire, and we've got our video here going from the experience into something there. So when the learners come in the next time, they can then access that, they don't have to search through things. And the, this, this cycle goes round and round and round. So we've got the tin can API at the top, capturing the learning experiences. Then you share it, people discuss, they get access to it, they get benefit from it. The curator then picks up the best stuff, curates that into a, a separate area where everybody knows that's the stuff that they should be doing, that's the, the great stuff on the system. And it goes round and round and round, getting better and better each time you go through the loop. But that's a tin can API. That solves the capture problem, but what about the motivation? So. Um, what could we add to this loop to make it stronger? How, how are we going to motivate users to get, get through it? And um, another emerging technology that's come in the learning industry is uh, the Mozilla Open Badges Initiative. Um, this again has big, big ideals. Um, it's backed by a big, big company, Mozilla, um, and it's having some good early success. Um, again, it's very, very simple. It's essentially a digital certificate that you can then share outside of where you got it. So for example, I could have done uh, 10 learning experiences on uh, leadership skills or something like that. Um, I, could have earned, I could have passed an assessment at the end of it. Um, at that point, I could get a certificate inside the business, it wouldn't mean much. What Open Badges does is it creates a digital certificate that you can then show off outside. So um, that ability to get recognition for your achievements um, adds extra motivation for the learner. So if we go back to our social system we've just described, if you've got extra motivation for the learners to capture more data because they're going to get these digital certificates, the open badge, they're going to capture more, they're going to share more and they're going to create more, driving the system round and round, getting better and better and better each time through. So, um, I'm just going to summarise the, the key points we've discussed today. It's just how technology can help 
these things. So we've got the tin can API with the capture, we've got the, the sharing in Tesla happening, and then the critical bit, which then turns just a social feed into something genuinely useful for the business, is the curation process. And we have the open badges adding the extra motivation through the system. Um, I, this, this is now, this is where we are right now, but who knows, there's many more technologies out there. Carl was talking about this mind melt thing, which sounds really, really interesting. I'm sure there's going to be more that can help us drive the users through this system. Um, if you've got any questions, Carl's just, uh, Charles is just going to come up. But if you'd like to see more of Tesla, just please pop over to the stand and I'll be happy to take any questions or show you through it. Thank you very much, John. Um, it, it, it strikes me that there are a couple of interesting things that um, we, we can use to perhaps make slightly more formal uh, a social learning platform for work. So one would be the sort of expert curation um, process and then the other is sort of slightly more formal recognition through badges or points. Um, I just want to go back to uh, the question earlier, actually, which, was, which is around uh, the multitude of different platforms that people at work have to, have to use. And um, you mentioned that, that Brightwave has a, an LMS, Tesla is a slightly different platform. How can social learning platforms um, work, work with a learning management system? I think that would be a question a lot of people have. Okay, so usually you've got your LMS, it's usually a big, big thing, there's usually thousands and thousands of things on there. They're usually quite hard to find stuff. Um, you can pick out some of the best things that are perhaps related to the, the, the subject matter of the Tesla site that you've got. And um, you can either put those, LM, uh, those LMS resources in Tesla, there's a, there's a SCORM interface within Tesla, or you can hook it up through an API to launch it on the, uh, the remote LMS. So we've got examples of that with our clients at the moment where um, you, click, you click on the resource within Tesla that the curators put there and then it actually launches it on the main LMS. And the user doesn't have to log in, it single signs them on and things like that. Okay. And then, uh, do you see any other sort of features apart from, uh, for example, badges that can, can, we might see enhancing motivation to, to use these platforms in, in future on the horizon? Um, well, within Tesla we've got this idea of reputation points, um, where each positive action that the user does, or the learner does, um, gives them some reputation points. And those reputation points are publicly available. So it's, it's a, again, it's another form of recognition within the social system, that as you do more things, as you share more things, as your resources get curated, um, you get more and more positive points for it, and your reputation grows within the system. Thank you. I think we might have time for, for one question from the audience if there is if there are any if, if anyone like it like to ask John a question before we move on okay right uh, if we could swap over the microphones and uh, and I can uh, we, we, we move naturally now from your first session which was around you know what can we learn from the the kind of uh, consumer social technologies that we're all familiar with how that's now starting to be uh, transferred into, into the world of work and the slightly different technologies that are available to us. Um, and, and then our, and our final um, speaker uh, is going to talk about how it's actually being, you know, being used uh, in, in his organization. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to, to Drew, who's going to talk about his experiences uh, using uh, Tesla at KPMG. Over to you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, John and Carl, for sharing your interesting insight this morning. So, my name is Drew Clare. I'm the Head of Learning Technology at KPG for the Lima region. Uh, my main role is deploying learning technologies, LMSs, virtual classrooms, mobile learning, social media. More recently, change management has become a much bigger part of my role. Um, to set the scene, my colleague, Nicole Wetzel, she's based in Munich in Germany. She's the program director for the Primary Central Masterclass, or PEM for short. Now, PEM is a face-to-face -face international partner development program. It's been running for around four years. 
Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I think it may be that you're not being heard, perhaps because the microphone isn't coming round enough. Would you like to use, would, would it be alright for, for you to use this one instead? Yeah, sure. Is this a bit louder for anyone, this one? Yeah? So I hope you didn't mean to knock you off your stroke. Is that better? Is that better? Okay. So PEM has been running um, for four years. It runs over an 18-month period. There are multiple cohorts. Each cohort meets four times a year. Last year, we launched uh, PEM Online to over 400 of our PEM participants across 20 countries in the EMA region. We used, as Charles said, Brightwave's Tesla product to do that. So when asked to speak at a conference, I thought, what can I speak about? What can I really share in this social media conversation? Well, I wanted to speak about what made PEM Online a successful project over and above having a, a good user interface and good user experience. And that success for me came from having a distinct change management stream to our project. So my interest in change, man change management developed two or three years ago, where we deployed a global virtual classroom our first global technology, quite a large project. Um, we treated it very much like a technology deployment. Unfortunately, we didn't take into account the challenges that the technology and the new way of learning would bring to our organization. So we threw open our virtual classroom doors and expected everybody to come rushing in. Unfortunately, the truth is a bit different. So when we looked at PEM, and we reflected on the virtual classroom project, there were a few um, areas that we wanted to focus at to really try and improve. Those areas being the business requirements, doing it for the right reason. A vision, giving something that people can buy into, something they can really believe in as to why are they using this platform. Support, helping them support themselves when they're using it. Behaviors, us understanding what they are supposed to do with the platform and for them to understand that as well. And a success criteria. And a success criteria, so how would we know that we had been successful at the end of the project? So as Carla said, getting a good user interface and user experience depends on the quality of your design. And so picking the right solution depends very much on the quality of your business requirements. Your business requirements should really be your decision drivers. So for PEM, our business requirements are very simple. They just said to us, make PEM online. Now at this conference, there are at least 20 ways that you can do that. We needed a bit more direction. That was too open-ended for us. We went back to our stakeholders and said, can we have a better steer? It's too open. And they said, you've just deployed virtual classroom make it a virtual program. Okay, this was better. My colleague, Nicole, she didn't like the idea of a virtual program. It didn't sit right with her. So we took some time, about two months in total, to really understand what PEM was all about. And it was all about getting people face-to-face, -face, breaking down barriers, both professional and personal, and getting them to think differently. A virtual program wasn't gonna deliver that for us. We then settled on a social media solution. We felt it would be better. It would allow our people to connect, to collaborate, and to coach each other. And those were key requirements of the program. Once we settled on a social media solution, I went to Online Educa over in Berlin. I met Charles there. Charles said, Drew, come to Learning Tech. We've got something we're unveiling. This was last January. We found two vendors here, and we invited both to tender Brightway was successful, and we went forward to deployment with them. But getting those business requirements correct before we met the vendors was absolutely paramount. So alongside our business requirements, we created a vision for PEM Online. And although I was putting the slides together, I thought we had a very grand vision. I'll try and dig it out. I'll give you just... A few seconds to read through that. It wasn't quite as grand as I remembered. In fact, it seemed quite 
short, um, but it is actually succinct, it's clear, and it spells out exactly what we wanted our platform to do and what we wanted it to achieve. So once we had our vision, we needed to communicate it, and we communicated it across every channel that we had available to us. Conference calls, WebExes, live meetings, in face-to-face -face discussions with our faculty, we really shared our vision with them. And we didn't just share it once. We shared it for the entire length of the project, over and over and over again. We didn't vary it, and we didn't dilute it. We stayed true to our original purpose. We did have a couple of tough cases. Um, we demoed Tesla last summer to our faculty group. One faculty in particular, Amanda, she said, I can see the benefits. I can see the value that this will bring to the program. I think it looks amazing. We just don't have anything like this at KPMG. But I'm not going to use it. I don't like social media. I don't like technology. It doesn't like me. And I don't have a Facebook account. So it's just not for me. I'm sure you can imagine how that made us feel. We were absolutely mortified. What were we going to do? We had to have this group engaged and supportive of what we were trying to achieve. So to overcome our faculty frustrations, we decided to gate crash their faculty day. Now faculty day for PEM is one day in the year when they all get together from across the region, review previous year's program and plan for the next. This year we turned up with our laptop projector, we threw PEM up on the wall and told them to pull out the device they had in their pocket or their handbag. We had a mixture of iPhones, iPads, laptops. We told them to log in and for the next two hours we took them through every screen and every behavior step by step until they knew exactly what they had to do and how they had to behave within the platform. I appreciate getting people together for a face-to-face -face session it's not practical, you'll have people geographically spread, but for us, it made a huge difference to the support and engagement that we got. And Amanda, our technophobe from earlier on, I'm really proud to say that she became our greatest advocate, our greatest supporter. I have a memory of her surrounded by her colleagues, and she is talking them through how to install the app, how to share videos, how to post comments. She really did have a 180 degree turnaround. So once they left faculty day, we gave them a 20 minute quick start guide so they could repeat the process with their own groups back on their programs. We also trained up all of the IT help desks across the 20 countries so that we could minimize any barriers or hurdles that prevented people getting onto PEM. So all of the cloud-based issues that you normally find, we mitigated any aspect of that occurring. So in order to get that success, we ensured that we understood our audience and the behaviors they needed to exhibit for the platform to be successful. We did that by looking at the feedback that we had got from PEM in the original project. We looked at the areas they were having trouble with and we based our behaviors on these. So connecting people was a big challenge. How do you keep people connected over 18 months when they're only together four times in that period? The faculty need to coach difficult to do that over an 18-month period when you're not seeing them every day. Sharing. I have to teach my kids to share constantly, and it's the same with adults. You need to teach them to share experiences and share their knowledge. PEM has a huge amount of course materials too, and we wanted to get the best from those materials. So using these as our starting points for behaviours, we made sure that we then understood our audiences. Were they faculty, participants, or administrators? We mapped audience to behavior a number of times in a very long, detailed process so we could actually role model every behavior for every audience and understood almost guarantee that we would get what we wanted at the end of that process. So when Nicole and I debriefed Faculty Day, my first words to Nicole were, oh my God, they were over-engaged. We had actually lost control of our faculty group on faculty day. We, we set them up, we got them going, and they actually ran riot. Um, we couldn't control them, they were over-engaged. 
we had exceeded our expectations of success. The criteria we'd given ourselves were having the faculty engaged, supportive, and able to use the platform to their full ability. They totally blew us away. The other criteria we had was to meet our original business requirements. The long list that we'd given Charles and the other vendors, did it tick every box that we needed it to tick? And I'm very happy to say that it did. So looking back on PEM, what made it a success? I believe it was successful because we checked and we challenged the need we got from our stakeholders and we validated it with them. We were successful because we chose an innovative and user-centric technology that people were excited to use. They wanted to engage with it. And I think we were successful because we defined and we planned the behaviours that we wanted to see within the platform. And that's how we deployed a successful social media platform at KPMG. Drew, thank you very much. It's, um, it's really, really interesting to, to hear how you, you almost treated this as a, as a change management program and, and put a lot of effort into, into getting it all set up. But once you, uh, once you, you got people engaged with it, they, they ran right as you, as you say. Which, uh, it's interesting you used, you used a couple of times the phrase, uh, you lost control. But I suppose in a way that was, uh, that was part of the success of it. You didn't actually have to control it. That's right. I mean, they, uh, we tried to structure our faculty day so we could walk them through the, every step. But once they got access and they were downloading the app, they were all at different stages of engagement. So it was, it was difficult to manage, but actually it showed how engaged and supportive they were. You've got, uh, you've got five points uh, there that you've, you've mentioned. I mean, out of those, which, which one, if, if you had to pick, do you think was, is the, the, the most important factor? Um, uh, I think behavior is, is the key one for me. Um, knowing what you want them to do, once you've got them in there, uh, for me is a key, a key piece. Without it, you can never, you'll never get the, the outcome you want unless you know what you want them to do with it. And I know that uh, within the organisation, your, your other communities and groups are going to be taking on a similar pla uh, platform. Um, if you were doing this again, would there be anything that you do differently? Uh, any lessons that you would uh, want to add to what you've already said to, to share with the audience here? Um, just, I think, ensuring that we had the change management stream running alongside the project. You can deploy technology fairly simply, but getting the most from it, getting the most of your return on investment, getting the most for your people, I think is, is now critical. You can't just invest and hope that they will come along and use it. You need to consider why they're using it, what you want them to do with it, and, and constantly measure that throughout the project and its use as well. Great. Well, listen, we, we're, we're coming up towards the end of our time, but we, we, if there are some uh, questions either for Drew or indeed any of the other speakers, um, do raise your hand now and I can share the microphone with you. You would be someone right at the back. <laughs> well, you could, you, is, there a, is there a mic that you can hand to him? No? Um, come, come, come up, come up. Sorry, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, how many users do you support at the moment? And how long per week do you think each user spends interacting with the content, either posting or reading content? That's a good question. I actually haven't checked the stats for that. We launched to 400 initially. Um, we've had about 200, I think, go through. Yeah. Does anyone else have a, a question for any of the speakers? Yes. Hi, you talked about um, they ran riot. How did you control them, or did you just let them run riot? What was the after effects of that? We actually let them run riot. Because for us, our partnership are highly intelligent, highly motivated. They're the people who run the organisation. So to get them all in a room at the same time is difficult, especially when they come across quite a big region. So we didn't want to put the brakes on and stop them, stop them, keep stopping them, say, no, come back a few steps. So we just let them go. And to have Amanda actually providing support that we would have been given was actually a much better because they'll take better guidance from their colleague 
they were no will from us. So it was, it was the best outcome for us. Yeah, I suppose with a, a group of senior people like that, they're not going to be easily told what to, to do, are they? But did you have any problems at all, uh, or could you foresee any problems by just uh, you know, allowing that sort of anarchy online? I think, yeah, it's, it, could have gone, it could have obviously gone horribly wrong. Um, but we had a small contained group, and it actually was the best outcome we got in the end. I think it's, it's also fair to say that the system allows anyone to report something that it may be inappropriate, as you would expect, and then, and then a moderator can, can uh, you know, uh, yes. I mean, uphold that or not. From a moderation perspective, as part of the sign-up process, we have global guidelines about how to behave in, in the social media space, um, and we made sure that all of them basically read and agreed to the terms of use before being allowed loose on the platform. So we kind of guaranteed good behavior but we wanted them to run right with the technology. Yep. Fascinating. Um, any other questions from the floor? Oh. Uh, how did you get your early adopters to engage those first few people using this platform? Those were the faculty group. They were our super users. They were the first people to be that loose on it. And they had to be the first ones because they are using it to deliver the program for all the cohorts in the rest of the program. So they were first wave. So they were pretty key then, really, yeah, to absolutely. the Pivotal. success. OK, thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? OK, well, I'm going to uh, thank our three speakers. There, 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 there will be opportunities to ask them one-to-one -one questions. I think they're all going to hang around for a bit and, and they'll be on, on the stand just here if you'd like to uh, continue the conversation or ask any, any uh, specific questions. Uh, but once again, uh, Carl, Jonathan and Drew, thank you very much.